if you're using this for extra credit or credit for any of your classes. Okay. Um, first of all, my name is Susan Mahoney. I teach Earth Science here at Kenyatta College. So that means I teach geology and geography and oceanography and environmental science. So if anything that our speaker today talks about intrigues you in some sort of way, feel free to follow up with her, of course, but you feel free also to follow up with me, okay? Um, I'd be happy to chat more with you about our classes here, about GE opportunities, about career opportunities, and all of that, okay? All right, so let's, um, let's get going here. This is, we're pleased to, to welcome Carla Grandy here t today from, from, yeah, give her a round of applause, sure. Um, um, and she joins us from Skyline College, where she is a full-time uh, professor of earth science there. Um, she has her, she's got all sorts of earth science degrees to back her up. She has an environmental geology degree, a bachelor's in environmental geology, a, a master's in, in, oceanograph in oceanography and, um, and marine planning or management, and also a PhD in earth science. Um, in addition to nearly 10 years of teaching, she has done considerable work in um, environmental consulting and in surface water management and other environmental planning here in the Bay Area. So, um, without any more to do here, I will just let Carla take over. Okay, hi there, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so, Erin asked me to talk about um, my background and how I got into STEM, and then also about some of the work that I do in STEM. So, um, that didn't show up very well, but I found this today and I thought it was cute, and I think I need a t-shirt that says that. Um, so I wanted to start out just by talking a little bit about what is geology and what do geologists do. So you guys just shout out, what do you think geology is? What do you think geologists do? Rocks. And what else? Rocks. Okay. So yeah. So that's what that's what people think about when you think about geology, and that's that's part of it. Um, for sure. And so what I want to talk to you about, I do very little with rocks. Um, and so I want to talk to you about some of the other things that geologists do besides study rocks and minerals. So just a few things to, to, to make you think about it. Um, most of the geologists that you hear, or most of the people who you hear on the news talking about things like climate change, or talking about water, talking about the drought, those are mostly geologists. Geologists also study things like earthquakes, volcanoes, all of that exciting stuff. Um, so, just here's a kind of list of what geologists do. And if you ask somebody, somebody's mostly not going to describe themselves as a geologist. So I describe myself as um, a coastal geomorphologist, which is a really specific thing. And I also do some hydrology. So there's a bunch of different fields here in terms of environmental geology, environmental engineering. Um, environmental lawyers and writers and things like that. So um, just to give you a sense that geology is more than just rocks. And then in terms of, um, because I know for the most part you're all in college because you're looking to get a career. Um, so the people who, and I'll talk more about this at the end, but just to get you paying attention to the fact that this is a real career that you can have, the people who would hire geologists would be any number of different state and government agencies, and I'll talk more specifically about what some of those are. Um, but then also local planning, city and county planning, um, environmental consulting firms, legal firms. And then there's a lot of work right now with things like um, both petroleum engineering, but then also alternative energies and the development of alternative energies as well. So that's a huge sector. Um, and then also looking at things like past climate, which would be paleoclimatology, to help you understand what's happening with climate now and predict what's going to happen in the future. So there's a lot of stuff you can do as a geologist. It's probably a lot more than, than what you think about geologists doing. So I'll talk more about that as we go through this. Um, but I want to talk now a little bit about my paths to STEM. So um, I'm from Texas originally, and I grew up, um, I'll show you a map in a second, but I grew up in kind of North Texas, and there's not, um, 
there's not a lot of super interesting geology there, but I was lucky that my dad in particular took me out hiking a lot, so we used to go to the lake and go hiking a lot from a very early age, and so I got really interested in, in all things outdoors from an early age. Um, also, being from Texas, people who are from Texas try to get out of Texas a lot, and so a lot of our... <laughs> A lot of our family vacations were going other places that were not like Texas. And so I also started scuba diving at a really early age. And that was something that I got interested in. Um, and it was kind of like the only thing I was interested in through like junior high and high school. Um, and then there was a big Earth Day that happened at some point. I can't remember when exactly. But when I was also in about middle school, and I got really interested in environmental issues. and. Um, at that point in Texas, there well, still in Texas, there's not a lot of, um, they're not very progressive in terms of environmental issues. And so I used to like make my friends recycle and things like that and um, led those kind of charges at school. And so from a pretty early age, like seventh grade or so, this is kind of what I've been interested in. Um, and. I liked science in school, but I wasn't a great science student. Um, and so, again, I'm from this part up here, like right where that Longhorn is, um, which is about 400 miles from the ocean. And so, even though that was something that I really wanted to study, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for it. I don't think I've been to the coast of Texas since I was like five years old. Um, so it wasn't something that we did on a regular basis. But I was lucky enough that in high school, I had a teacher who taught marine biology and oceanography. So I got that exposure and realized that I was really interested in ocean things. So then um, my undergraduate experience was at TCU, Texas Christian University. And I got a bachelor's degree in environmental geology. Um, and I kind of went there because it's all I knew. My parents had gone there. It was five minutes from my house. Um, my aunts and uncles had gone there. It was just, that was, that was where you went. Um, and so I went there, I studied geology, and um, I got exposed to a lot of things that were really interesting to me. So actually, take a step back. I started out as an accounting major um, because my dad thought I should. <laughs> And so that didn't last beyond my first semester. I realized that I really was more interested in the sciences. Um, and so I switched my major to environmental science. But then I found out I didn't really like biology, but I really did like geology. Um, and so I started digging more into that. At that point, I was really concerned, though, that there weren't any jobs in geology. And so that kind of held me back from pursuing it for a while. Um, but eventually I did, and I found out that you can kind of mesh the two. There is a lot of geology and environmental issues, which is kind of what I was interested in. Um, so I put the van up there because that's a big part of geology. As a geology major, you spend a lot of time in those white vans um, going around looking at different geologic features and rocks and things like that. And so getting out in the field is a big part of the degree. There's definitely geology that can be done in a lab on a computer, but as a geology student, you get out and look at this stuff up close. So I went there for undergrad, and then as a graduate student, I went to Oregon State. I did that right after undergrad, um, and had a got a master's in oceanography with an emphasis in marine resource management. And so I was, by this point, already really interested in coastal things, but also interested in kind of all aspects of marine environmental issues. So I got an internship with the Oregon Parks Department, and I worked as a coastal land use coordinator there. Um, and so through that, and this is kind of a theme that I'll come back to, which is like take any opportunity you were presented with. Um, there's no bad opportunities. So through that internship, I ended up doing my thesis looking at engineering um, for coastal protection structures, so things like riprap and seawalls, looking at how they should be engineered and whether they were being engineered properly. 
So not exactly science, kind of more on the, the engineering side of things, but looking at how the two things relate to each other. Um, so the other big thing for me in terms of my development along my career paths was that at OSU, um, I taught for the first time. So uh, oftentimes, if you go to graduate school in science, they will pay you to go to school if you teach a class or if you TA a class. And so I did that for the first time at Oregon State, and I was terrified of it um, to begin with, but then it turned out to actually be fun. And I had no idea that this was something that I would have been interested in, um, but after doing it, I, it turned out that I really liked it and, and wanted to continue doing it. So it's another case of don't turn down opportunities, especially if it's paying for your school. So after I finished at Oregon State, I moved to the Bay Area and I worked for the California State Coastal Conservancy for a couple of years. So this is a state agency that gets money from the state and then they um, manage and fund conservation projects along the coast of California. So at this time, they, one of their big projects was to develop a coastal trail, a hiking trail that went all the way from Oregon to Mexico along the coast. And so that was my, that was why they hired me. Um, and so I went out, it was a really cool job because I had just moved to California. I didn't know much about the state. And so they paid me to just drive up and down the state and hike basically, find the trails, map them in GIS, which I'll talk about more later, um, and then identify where there were trails missing, talk to the cities and counties, and figure out how to get trails built. And so it, it was a really cool job. Um, and then the funding ran out on that, so then I started working on sediment management projects, so things like dam removals, and looking at, this is a big dam in Southern California, looking at if you take the dam down, what happens to all of the sediment and water and stuff that's behind it. And so um, I worked on those two projects for a while, but then the funding started to run out for my position, and I really wanted to go back to grad school because I wanted to teach. I actually missed teaching. And so I ended up at UC Santa Cruz, where I did a PhD in Earth Sciences. And um, so UC Santa Cruz, beautiful campus. If you're, ever, if you're interested in any of this kind of stuff, it's a great place to be. Um, and I'm going to talk to you more about my research there, and then I'll talk some more about more recent research. Um, I put this guy up here because he's my, my PhD advisor. And so another kind of piece of information or piece of advice, and I've been talking to my own students about this recently, if you're looking to go to grad school in particular, even if you're looking to transfer to an undergraduate four-year program, it's a really good idea to find out who's doing the kinds of things you're interested in and talk to them. So I got accepted to this program um, because of the experience that I had, because I worked at the Coastal Conservancy, which does a lot of cool things, and, and because I reached out to, to him, my advisor, and talked to him and got to know him in advance, and so I got accepted to that program. Um, so it's really, really important, and I'll, I'll say this again, but it's really important to talk to people who are doing things that you think you might want to do. Even if you're not sure what you want to do, just talk to people who you think are doing things somewhat related because that you never know what that can lead to. Um, I'm kind of opportunistic, it sounds like, but it's true, and it pays off. So that's, that's my background, and now I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, my research and my uh, my area of study. Okay, so um, this is the big project that I did in grad school, um, which has kind of continued on since then. Um, and what we were looking at is how to relate changes in climate and changes to land use, basically, um, to sediment supply and how that affects beaches. So a lot of people, um, a lot of scientists are focused on the science and they're just interested in the scientific aspects of things and that's true for a lot of geologists. Um, I'm, I've always been interested in the way that the science and the people interact with each other. So the two things, 
particularly from the perspective of environmental geology, the two things affect each other. You can't separate them. Um, and so that's kind of what's going on here, is trying to figure out which is more important, climate um, or land use changes and things that people do in terms of beaches. So this project that I'm going to talk about um, was funded by the UC Marine Council and the Department of Boating and Waterways, which is a really small little state agency. Um, but they're interested in marine recreation. And so this project is looking at how beaches are changing. And so it was something that they were willing to pay for because they wanted to find out too. So um, the area that I studied was the Oceanside Littoral Cell. So this is San Diego. Um, you can see here's La Jolla. And a littoral cell is just like a confined area of beach. So basically, it's like a really big pocket beach. Um, and so all of the sand on the beaches comes from these areas inland or comes from the areas offshore. And it gets trapped within these two, two things at either end and it moves along the shore. Um, so what I was looking at was how those beaches within that area had changed over the course of the study, which I should have said. But if you look at, there, here we are, zoomed in. Um, if you look at how this area changes um, from the up coast to the down coast, it's mostly, well, one, it's really developed. So almost all of it has houses and highways and things like that. And that's part of the land use piece, is how the things that people have done affect the beaches and the sediment supply. Um, the other thing that you can see is that some of these areas are flat beach, and some of them have sea cliffs behind them, more like what the beaches around here look like. So I'll talk about that more in terms of um, the sediment supply in a second. So why do we care is always an important question. Anytime you're doing anything, um, and I have to, anytime I'm doing anything, I have to keep reminding myself, why do we care? Because if we don't care, then there's no reason to continue on with it. Um, but in this case, the reason why people cared and the reason why people were willing to pay for this project was because those beaches in San Diego one, they have an ecological um, significance. Organisms live in the beach and live on the beach, um, and that's a piece of it. But the bigger piece, as far as they were concerned, um, was the economics of it. Um, so millions of visitors come to San Diego every year, and it's a billion dollar industry. There's billions of dollars to their local economy from tourists. So people come from all over the country, all over the world, and when you think of San Diego, you think of warm and you think of beaches, okay? And so in these areas, the kind of uh, feeling was that the beaches were narrowing, the anecdotal evidence. What people have been saying for a long time was that the beaches were eroding and they were going away. And so um, they were losing this source of revenue in terms of being able to bring in tourists for that. Um, the other piece of it is that beaches provide a buffer. So if you've got a house that's built at the back of the beach, that beach can keep it from um, falling off if there's a big, um, a big storm. And it can also <coughs> reduce the risk of flooding to those areas that are behind there. Um, so there's kind of three things, ecological impact, the economic impact, and the buffer from storms. So that's why we care. And then what I actually did was this makes it look pretty simple. <laughs> but look at historical aerial photographs of the area. So um, this is using GIS, or Geographic Information Systems, which is a really great tool to have. It's useful in a lot of different sciences. Um, but I collected a bunch of different um, aerial surveys. So images going back to 1945, um, and looked at them to measure the width of the beach from the north to the south end, and then just compared how it changed over time. So that part is pretty straightforward. Um, and then the not so straightforward part is trying to figure out why. So what everybody had said was that the beaches are getting narrower, but it turned out that that wasn't the case, and I'll show you that in a minute. 
Um, but let's talk first about why beaches would get narrower or wider. So, um, that blue really doesn't show up very well, does it? Um, the major sources of sand to a beach, and this is, this is true for most California beaches. So most of the sand on the beaches comes from rivers and sea clefts. Um, we'll talk about the land use piece of that in a minute, but just from a accounting perspective, if you have more sources of sand than sinks of sand, so you've got more sand coming to the beach than leaving the beach, then the beach gets wider. If you've got less sand coming to the beach than leaving the beach, then the beach narrows. And this is what they thought was happening, that the beach was getting narrower. And so the question is why? Why would that be happening? Um, so taking it a step further, the beach width is equal to those two things that we just talked about. So rivers and sea cliffs. And then the waves play a big role as well. So waves move sand to the beach, they move it along the beach, and then they move it offshore. So all of these three things here are a function of climate. They're all affected by climate and weather. Um, and so that's the first piece of this, is trying to understand how climate has changed over that time and how that can affect weather. So around here, and especially lately, we've been hearing a lot about El Nino. Um, and in terms of beaches and their kind of annual oscillation, um, El Nino plays a huge role. So I'm not going to go over this in super detail, but I'm just going to talk about it really quickly. Um, what happens during an El Nino event, and this is what's happening right now, is that we get warm water that pools off of the west coast of North and South America. And that warm water is normally on this side. And so you'll hear it called El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is an oscillation of temperature and pressure conditions from one side to the other. So normally it's over here. And then when we have an El Nino event, it sloshes to this side of the ocean basin. So we get this big pool of warm water sitting over here. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But what happens when there's a big pool of warm water offshore is that you have more evaporation and more storms. And so in California and all along the west coast of North and South America, we get more storms during an El Nino event. So here's what that looks like. This is um, normal conditions. You've got this warm pool. We're looking at a slice of the Pacific Ocean. So normally you've got this warm pool on this side of the Pacific Ocean, but then during El Nino it sloshes to the other side. So it pools up over here um, and kind of sits along the equator and then spreads north and south, and that leads to evaporation and storminess. So when we have storminess, we have a lot more geological activity. So it's not just in the atmosphere, but all of these other geologic hazards um, are intensified because of it. So when we have big El Nino storms, we have lots more flooding, we have landsliding, and we have coastal erosion. So all three of these things, even the, the landsliding and the flooding, which don't necessarily seem like they're associated or would affect coastal erosion, actually do. So when you have landslides, you've got slopes collapsing, and that's creating more sediment that can then be picked up and carried to the beach. And when you have bigger floods, rivers are the main source of sediment to the beaches. So when you've got big floods, you've got a lot more water moving and a lot more sediment being transported. And so both of these things can increase the sediments, so they increase the sources, so they have the potential to make the beach wider. As opposed to coastal erosion, which is mostly a function of waves. When we have El Ninos, we also have really big waves. And so they come in and erode the, the coastline. OK, so that's kind of the basics of how it works. Um, let's look a little bit more specifically. So this is pretty much just what we just said. El Nino events increase precipitation they increase storm activity, and both of this is on our side of the Pacific, so on the, um, the eastern side of the Pacific. And 
Not only do they increase storm activity, but they tend to shift storms that are in the Pacific a little bit further south. And so what that meant for this area in San Diego was that they were getting hit more intensely, more directly, by big storm waves, big winter storm waves during El Niños. Um, during La Nina, which is the opposite, it's the, the flip-flop where the warm water is on the western side of the Pacific. In California, we have less precipitation and less storm activity. So it's just the switching of um, both atmospheric and geologic conditions. So what you're looking at on the top is what's called the multivariate INZO index. So this is just a way of accounting for how strong an El Nino event is. And it takes into account things like sea surface temperature and wind speed and atmospheric pressure and all the stuff that is part of an El Nino. And so what it's showing you is how strong these different events are. So the red blobs that are on the, the top, well, first of all, the line at zero would be normal. And it's almost never normal. There's always a little bit more intense on one side or the other. But the red ones are El Nino events, and then the blue ones are La Nina events, or colder events. So what you can see is that we have periods that are more intense in one direction or another. So what that is called, um, and this was figured out by a fisheries biologist, so again, bringing together lots of disciplines, um, but in the Pacific, we have these 30-year oscillations between El Nino-type weather and La Nina-type weather. And this is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So we have warm phases and cool phases. Um, right now, we are in a cool phase of the PDO. So we're having an El Nino event, but we're in the cool <coughs> phase of the PDO. So generally speaking, the conditions that we expect with that are less rain um, and drought-type conditions. But what we see in the coastal areas is that you, when you're in the warm phase, the El Nino phase of it, um, we have more of all of this kind of activity. Okay? Does that make sense? No? Okay. So let's see. So that's the climate side of things, and that's how climate affects the sediment budget, basically. How much sand gets brought to the beach, how much sand moves along the beach. The other side of that is the stuff that people do. Um, so, we have anthropogenic or human-caused effects on the sediment budget, and um, particularly in Southern California, there's very few natural beaches left. Almost everything is developed, and there's been stuff done to the beaches. So, if the main sources of sediment to beaches are rivers and sea cliffs, um, most of the rivers in California have been dammed. And so dams cut off the sediment supply. The sediment accumulates behind it and doesn't make its way to the beach. So that reduces the sediment supply. The other main source of sediment that we talked about were the sea cliffs. Uh, most, in Southern California in particular, most of the sea cliffs have seawalls on them, which means that that sediment has been cut off as well. So between those two things, the sediment supply has been reduced greatly from the natural sources. But the other thing that's happened um, is that sediment supply has been increased from beach nourishment. So beach nourishment is when we take sand from one place and bring it and dump it on the beach. Sometimes it's from offshore, sometimes it's from upstream, sometimes it's from someplace totally different but it alters the sediment supply by bringing this kind of artificial source of sand. So this area that we're talking about had a lot of beach nourishment. Um, so we're looking, this is 1942 through 2002, um, and this is cubic meters of sand to the beach. So particularly earlier on in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there was a lot of beach nourishment happening. A lot of sand, there were a lot of big construction projects in San Diego, and so what would happen is they'd dig up all the sand and then they'd go and dump it on the beach. And so it kind of artificially changed the beach widths. Um, and there's what that looks like. You see this around here if you ever, I don't know too much about the San Mateo County Coast, I haven't heard of many projects here, but in along Ocean Beach you'll see it a lot, the truck sand from the north end of Ocean Beach to the south end of Ocean Beach. 
in San Francisco. Um, so there was a lot of this that happened kind of in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in San Diego. And so it turns out that if you look at the overall sediment budget of this area, um, we're looking now at both time, changes in time, and then along shore. And these are sediment inputs from those three main sources. So the cliff erosion and the fluvial erosion, um, cliff erosion is kind of constant, but then there's a few big times when there was a lot of sand that was eroded from sea cliffs. The fluvial erosion is not constant. It has these few spikes that happen. Um, and so both of those two natural sources were really episodic, and they are really closely related to El Nino events. When we had an El Nino, there was a bunch of sediment that got moved and dumped on the beach. Um, the beach erosion is the blue. And so you can see up here, there's a lot, oh, sorry, beach nourishment. You can see that there's a lot of beach nourishment in here and then not as much in here. So what that all means together is that it's really complicated. So in terms of understanding how beaches have changed and why beaches have changed, there's a lot of different stuff going on at the same time. There's this climate signal um, that kind of oscillates between El Nino and La Nina weather and sediment movement. And then there's the stuff that people do. So, getting to the good stuff. Um, if you look at the changes over time, these are for all the beaches from north to south, and this is change in meter. So up would be a positive change, meaning that it's widening, and down's a negative change, meaning that it's narrowing. Um, there's not a real clear signal. So some of the areas widened, some of them narrowed, but it wasn't what we were expecting. It wasn't what the people who paid for this project thought was gonna happen, um, or it wasn't what the people who lived there thought was going to happen. And so it turns out that it's more complicated. Um, if you break it down and look at it by periods, um, first of all, in the earlier part of the study, there's not a real trend. Some areas get bigger, some areas get smaller from one time to the next. So this has changed from the, from the previous record. And what I concluded was that that was the signal from the stuff that people were doing, basically. So in particular, the beach nourishment. It's very localized in terms of the effect that it has. San Diego County, um, in the early 2000s, did a big beach nourishment project where they spent like $17 million, put a bunch of sand on various beaches, and then by the next year, it was all gone. Um, and that's because we have really intense waves, big waves, on the West Coast, and that sediment gets moved along. It doesn't stay put. So we have these areas that were nourished early on. The beach got wide, but then it got narrow again really soon. Um, and so it seems like all this kind of uh, scatter that you see in here is the function of that. These areas were locally changed with the addition of sediment that was brought in from other places. And then you get to the later part of the study. So these were the last three sets of aerial photographs. Um, and there's more of a climate-related signal. So every place is kind of behaving the same, going from being wider to being narrower to being wider. Um, and so once the beach nourishment stopped, it seemed like the beaches were responding more to the natural climate signal. Okay, so um, here's kind of what that looks like in a, a simplified flow chart is that we've got these two different things going on. So we've got these climate cycles, which have two different effects. So they increase precipitation, which increases sediment input. Um, but they also have bigger waves, which means that more sediment gets moved faster. Uh, it speeds up the sediment movement. And then the storm track also gets dislocated, as opposed to the opposite happening with La Nina type weather. And then there's the anthropogenic part of it, or the human-caused part of it, which is that we've built a lot of dams, and dams reduce sediment supply. We've built a lot of seawalls, and seawalls reduce sediment supply. And then kind of later, in the, the later half of the last century, um, there was a lot of beach nourishment that happened, which was artificially changing the beaches. 
So there's a lot going on, and it's not as simple as it seems that the beaches are changing. Okay, so that's the, the short version of that project. Um, I have a couple more minutes, so I want to talk to you about another more local um, kind of project. Well, first of all, so since being out of grad school and since being more in a teaching role, I've been doing more hydrology consulting. And so that a lot of that is around here. So that means like looking at streams, measuring stream flow, relating that to sediment transport, and then looking at contaminants in water. So um, like there was a project that I did just over here looking at how the horses um, were impacting the, the stream and whether the nutrient levels were too high and things like that. So that is kind of where my work has gone since then. Um, and I wanted to show you guys, just because it's a cool project, um, a project in Pillar Point Harbor, so just north of Half Moon Bay. Um, and so this has been ongoing for the last six years or so, and it just, it just got published. But this was a microbial source tracking. So this is Pillar Point Harbor, um, and there's a big houseboat population um, lots of birds, lots of marine mammals, lots of dogs. There's a couple of streams that feed into it. And so they had an E. coli problem. The water was contaminated with pathogens. And so the San Mateo County Resource Conservation District wanted to find out where that was coming from, what was the source of the contamination. Um, and so they hired the firm that I was working with to look at the circulation within the harbor, and then a couple of microbiologists from UC Davis to look at the microbiology part of things and where, what was going on with that and the pathogens. Um, and so this is like one of my favorite all-time projects because what it involved was, um, I'll show you a picture in a second, but we released a bunch of dye into the harbor. And then over the course of like a week, tested how much there was at certain locations. So looked at how it moved around the harbor. And so what you're looking at here is a map for kayakers. So we got like 100 people to volunteer to go out in kayaks and take samples of the water. So it was this big citizen science program. Um, I got a bunch of my students involved, and then there were just also a bunch of local people who were interested in it. And so these are all the different stations for people to go out and take a sample, and they had to label their samples. Um, and so then this is, oh, that doesn't show up that well. But this is what that looked like after we released the dyes. We had two different types of dyes. Um, and so we released them at certain points, and then we tested the water to see, and we used a fluorometer um, afterwards because you couldn't, after, a few hours, you couldn't actually see the dye in the water, but you could detect it with an instrument. And so we took all these samples and then we, we looked at the circulation patterns within it to try to figure out where the microbial contaminants were going. So this is more of a water quality issue, um, very directly related to the people and animals that are living here, but it's using that same kind of uh, knowledge. So understanding circulation processes from both an oceanographic and a geologic perspective. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys with my remaining time just about to kind of sum up some of the, the um, my recommendations for you if, as you move forward in a STEM um, pathway, or really, it doesn't even have to be STEM, no matter what you do, I think this is good advice. So, um, first thing is talk to people who do what you want to do, no matter what, no matter if you think that it's not exactly what you want to do, but it's kind of related to what you want to do, talk to them and ask them for advice. Um, ask them what classes you should be taking, ask them, um, where you should consider transferring to, who you should talk to, what conferences you should go to. Anything that you can think of, just get on their radar. Even if it's not real questions that you have, it's just kind of getting to know them. 
um, it's really important to um, to put yourself out there and to get to know people because that's where a lot of these opportunities come from. Um, for example, right now I'm doing a water quality project around here, sampling um, mercury levels in runoff from the San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. And so I've reached out to all of my former students who have told me that they're any, in any way interested in this. And so I have like four of them now doing this as an internship and getting paid for it and getting experience for it. Um, so you never know who's going to be able to help you with what. So just talk to people. Doesn't hurt. Um, go to conferences. So conferences are expensive, but for you guys, they're often free. Um, conferences will often take students as volunteers to help pass out programs or do whatever um, during them. And that's a great opportunity to meet people and talk to people and also to find out what's going on in the fields that you think you might be interested in. Um, I've used the conference experience a lot of times to meet people who I wanted to meet who I didn't have another opportunity to. And so again, it's just all about networking and finding out what people are doing and finding out what you want to do. Um, get any experience that you can. So I've done a bunch of um, jobs and internships that I didn't really want to do, that I wasn't really that interested in, um, but they're, it's all good experience. Anything that you can add to your resume, um, add to your applications when you're looking to transfer or apply to different programs is all good. If you can get in with faculty here who are doing research or who will help you to do research, that's all good too. Any experience that you get, and especially if you can present it, that gets your name out there and gets your face out there. Um, apply for opportunities even if you think you won't get them. So that goes for scholarships, grants, jobs, whatever. You never know what you're going to get and what you're not going to get. And even going through the process of applying for something is really good practice. It helps with your writing skills, it helps with your organizational skills, it helps with your communication skills in general. So just apply for stuff. Um, and then the last one, talk to people. So that's kind of my most important message of the day. And this is coming from somebody who doesn't really like to talk to people. Um, but it's really important to talk to people. They, you never know who you're going to meet or what they're going to be able to uh, help you with down the road. Okay, so that's all. Wait, no, that's all I have to say. Um, I'll, I'll put this up here. So this is a short list. You can find exhaustive lists online. But if you're at all interested in these, these fields, these are some places where um, you might check out for jobs, internships, things like that. There's a lot of cool opportunities out there. Um, so I'll leave that there for now and I guess ask if you guys have any questions. Susan? What, what's the source of the E. coli? Um, so I kind of glossed over that because we didn't really figure it out. It was kind of coming from everywhere. It, it seemed like the birds and the dogs were the biggest culprit, and the houseboats is what we had been really looking to make sure it wasn't, and it wasn't the houseboats. Okay. Another question over here somewhere? Questions? Yes, sir. What would you say would be your most recent accomplishment? My most recent accomplishment? Oh my goodness. That's inspiring. <laughs> um, so I'll take back to this piece, which I also skipped over, which is the stuff that I do at Skyline now. And so I think I've kind of um, moved on to my most recent accomplishment being working with students and getting students inspired about this stuff and connecting students with opportunities. So um, these are a number of my students in class. And then this is a, a, a water resources um, environmental management class that I taught. So this was a group 
a very small group of students, but what we did was we created a study um, to look at contamination from Heron's Head, which is in the eastern part of San Francisco. And so this group of students and I went out and did that. And now two of them have gone on since then to graduate school in the field. And so that, that was huge. But that's kind of, for me now, that's the really exciting stuff, is getting students fired up about it. So a lot of it is um, runoff from vehicles and things like that. There's also a lot of mercury contamination in the bay. That's what's considered legacy um, pollutants that is attached to sediments but came down from like mining. So there's some of that that's industrial leftover legacy, and then there's some of it that's more recent. So geology is such a uh, very wide subject. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself practicing uh, with Yeah. So my background definitely and the stuff that I'm interested in is the, the geomorphology, so the changing surface of the earth and how that relates to climate and um, and then the hydrology part, so the water part. And in terms of, you know, you guys all said it's rocks and minerals. That's kind of the part that I'm least excited about. Rocks and minerals are cool, but that's not really my area of study. What else? Everybody, let's give Carla a round of applause. Thanks for the teacher. Don't forget to grab a cart on the way out. Uh, there is some more pizza, so go ahead and grab a slice too if you'd like. Thank you all for coming. Oh, and Carla will be here to answer any questions if anyone wants to stick around and ask. Them. Thank you. 